Hello, everybody. Um, so yeah, I'm Alana Cole. Um, my name is up behind me. Um, I am a researcher in queer representation and queerness in games and also queerness in the games industry. Um, so this is an area that I'm super passionate about and that I love working in. Um, I am the founding director of Queerly Represent Me, which is also up on the slide behind me. So I'm super happy in terms of tweeting, tweeting at me, tweeting about me, take photos if you want. Um, and you can also tweet at uh, Queerly Represent Me if you are interested in finding out more about kind of the work that we do, the research and so on. Does this work? Yes. Cool. Um, so like it was kind of just introduced today, I'm going to be talking about um, something that's really, that I'm really passionate about and that I love kind of covering. Um, so I'm going to be talking about plurisexuality and player sexuality. Um, so often when I come to events, I get asked to kind of do the queer 101. Um, it's something that I'm really happy and passionate about doing as well. Like I, I know a lot about that, so I get why that kind of comes up. But uh, yeah, there's, there's definitely something special about coming to an event and being able to talk about something that's like really specific in that and that is close to my heart. So this is a topic that I love and I mostly love talking about it because I identify as bisexual. Um, and it's really important for me today that I get to talk about this in particular because today, the 23rd of September, is Bi Visibility Day. Um, so hello, I'm visible for one day a year. This is my face. Um, <laughs> hello. Um, so yeah, I identify as bi, I identify as bi for a lot of reasons, um, but I really enjoy kind of definitions of bisexuality that, you know, I'm not trying to pick a fight. So like a really inclusive definition of bisexuality, I'm attracted to people who are similar to me and people who are different to me. Um, and I just wanted to take a moment to kind of point out that bisexual people exist because that's what today is for. Um, and I think that's really important. So. When I talk about bisexuality in games, I use a term called plurisexuality in particular. And the reason for that is because bisexuals aren't the only people who are attracted to multiple genders. So you have um, bisexual people, you have pansexual people, you have people who just call themselves queer or you know, non monosexual or whatever. So I use plurisexual as an umbrella term because it's not something that individual people typically use as their own identities. And I think sometimes it's important to find umbrella terms that aren't also used by individuals because I think um, umbrella terms can kind of encapsulate a lot of people and not everyone who chooses a term as an individual also wants to kind of be lumped in with other people with that term necessarily. So it, yeah, it's the term I found for that. That will probably evolve over time as all things in queerness do. So when I talk about plurisexuality, I'm very much just talking about actual explicit like bisexuality or other, other non-monosexual identities and people who are very explicitly identifying in that way. Um, it's defined more than just sexual or romantic behaviour um, that is displayed toward a player in a game. So what I'm talking about today is like really game specific because it's what I love doing. Um, and plurisexuality yeah, has this kind of definition, this explicitness that's not just about the player. There's evidence about self-identification, relationship history, or some sort of queerness in the game world around um, the NPCs that are identifying as bisexual or plurisexual, um, and that's an important part of that as well. Compared to that is player sexuality. So player sexuality is a term that's used um, to describe attraction to the player character regardless of gender. So it's not about anybody regardless of gender or it's not about attraction to multiple people, it's about attraction to the player. So they become not bisexual or plurisexual or what, what not, they become player sexual, that's who they're attracted to. Um, it's defined by sexual or romantic behaviour just toward the player um, and there's typically no evidence of self-identification, relationship history, or queerness in the game world around them. So often these characters um, exist in a very heteronormative world. They exist in a space that, you know, is a lot of men and women in lovely families with children and whatnot, and it's this, like, one person or this group of romanceable characters that might be queer, and it's totally optional as to whether or not the player gets to experience that or not. So these are the terms that I'm going to be using today, plurisexual and player sexual, and I'm going to run you through some, kind of some stats and some examples and some actionable kind of steps in terms of uh, both as if anyone is a developer or as a player of games that you can actually take to try and um, lean more toward explicit plurisexuality and avoid player sexuality where you can. 
Um, please come back. All right. So let's start with some statistics. Um, so one of the benefits of running a foundation like Queerly Represent Me is that I get access to all sorts of research and data because it's what we do. Um, so I just wanted to start with this graph. This graph shows um, the representation of queerness in games over time using, it's, it's a little bit hard to say whether it's representation or just the distribution or archiving of that representation because obviously in the land of the internet we have much better access to these games on things like itch.io. We can actually kind of discover this a little bit easier. But um, either way, you can see that things are looking kind of positive. So um, we, at the time of these slides being made, we had 812 titles with queer representation in uh, QRM's database. Um, this graph is just with standalone titles, so titles that um, aren't part of a franchise. And from like 1986 or so through to uh, 2016, it covers kind of how many titles there were that featured some sort of queer rep. This is anything from a background character who is gay or a gay bar or something like that in the game through to the protagonist being very vocally queer in some way. And you can see obviously that over the last kind of four or five years we have had a massive spike in the types of games that are coming out and the representation in those games. Um, I've done kind of talks on dissecting the ins and outs of that but this is just kind of a nice optimistic way <laughs> to start I think. Um, splitting that up a little bit in terms of the um, types of identities there, and that graph is really hard to read, I'm sorry. Um, we have kind of just general kind of things that we can observe. So if you have a look at this graph, that pink line is the total number of characters with different types of identities in those games that we feature. Um, and then the three bars are green for protagonist, uh, purple for NPCs, and yellow for other. Um, so just general things, we, ha we can see that, you know, there's a lot more NPCs that are queer than there are protagonists that are queer. We can see that um, there are a greater number of lesbian protagonists than there are kind of any other um, options. Um, and it's kind of close to player sexual, which I'll get into as well. Um, and you can also see that there are a greater number of gay NPCs than there are of any other kind. So it's harder to find a gay man that you can play in a game. It's easier to find a lesbian woman, but you can find more gay men in games generally than you can anything else. Um, focusing on the actual stuff that I'm getting into today, so um, this graph kind of points out the bisexual and plurisexual category that we have, and it points out the player sexual category. So you can see that there are a lot fewer um, bisexual representations than there are player sexual representations, which just has like a pretty pie graph to point that out. Um, so yeah, we can, we can basically just point out that uh, based on the categorizations we have, um, it's a lot harder for us to find truly plurisexual characters in games than it is for us to find people who are just interested in the player regardless of gender. Cool. So this brings me to my examples, which I think is kind of the more interesting discussion point. Um, so Stardew Valley is a game that I love dearly, and I think it's a good example of a game where not not every game that you can criticise um, is necessarily a game that you hate. Not every game that you love is necessarily without fault. So I love this game very much. I've put hundreds of hours into this game. But it does have what is quite a pure player sexual uh, representation. It's a very good example. So um, for anyone who's not familiar, this is a game that has romanceable characters. You can kind of go and it has a kindness coin style mechanic where you put kind of gifts in and they give you a relationship back eventually. That's kind of how it works. Just like real life, you know, you just give them an apple twice a week, every week, and then. <laughs> so um, there are a number of romanceable characters. There are equal numbers of men and women who are romanceable in the game. And no matter what, you can only pick a binary um, gender for your own character. And whichever one you pick, doesn't matter. You can still romance both the men and the women so long as they're romanceable in the system. There's um, no real history of romance uh, for any of them. There's no sense of self-identity. None of the characters who apparently will like you, whether you're a man or a woman, will have any kind of history that indicates that. Um, they have no moment where they tell you that they're bi and the story of that or anything like that. Um, there's some kind of relationships in town, but they're all between men and women. Uh, so basically, if you decide to have a queer relationship and you try to you decide to marry your 
same gendered partner or whatever, everyone's a little bit like, oh, wow, you're bringing this really interesting new thing to our town. <laughs> and, you know, like, it's a little bit of a country town, it's a bit rural, like, I kind of get that a little bit, but it, it, they kind of oversell it a little bit as well. It's, it's quite strange. Um, so yeah, they, they are all a bit shocked, they're all a bit uncomfortable about it. Um, but yeah, it's, it's very much a player sexual system. And it's a good example, I guess, of why people make player sexual systems. So this gives people the option of being queer if they want to be, but people can also dodge it if they want to as well, which is kind of hedging your bets a little bit. You want to make sure that queer audiences feel like they get something out of the experience. But you also want, you know, homophobes not to put down your game. Personally, I wouldn't care if homophobes put down my game, right? But when there are people in your market that you're explicitly excluding by making these things compulsory to see, that makes it kind of, like I, I see sort of why people make these choices. But they're not good choices. I don't like them. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a lazy thing, right? It's, if you try to make it so that every relationship is heterosexual, you actually have to put something in the system that when you choose to play as a woman, for instance, all of the women who are romanceable in the game are no longer interested in the player. You actually have to like put something in the game to tell it that. This sort of system just says, these characters are romanceable, don't even bother checking what the gender is, doesn't matter. They won't react to you really any differently. Um, the only thing that will change are the pronouns that they use, and that is just like a quick switch in the, in the background. And there's no kind of gender neutral options. It's like he or she or whatever, and that's it. So there's, there's a lot of kind of issues with the way that this approaches queerness. Um, it kind of includes it in like the, the method of least resistance and doesn't really include anything more than that. Sorry, the clicker has a slight delay. Okay, so another example here that people often refer to for talking about player sexuality is Fallout. Um, Fallout has uh, some, a, a lot of different things that I could critique depending on what I'm focusing on. Uh, but obviously today, just looking at this idea of player sexuality, it has um, companions that you can choose, like looking at the most recent game, Fallout 4 in particular. Um, there are companions that you can choose to spend time with, they can fight alongside you, and if you would like, they can also become your romantic partners. Um, it's slightly different in that instead of giving them gifts, you kind of share experiences with them. You can still kind of rig it a little bit, so like if someone really likes it when you use power armor, you can get in and out of power armor repeatedly until they love you. Um, <laughs> But uh, there's still this idea that like, oh, I like you because you use this cool tech or I like you because we go to this place or you respond to conversations in this way. So it's a little bit more uh, reflective of how the world works a little. Um, there are a few other little bits and pieces in here as well that make it a slightly less pure, pure player sexual um, game, I guess. Um, so there are some flirtations outside of the relationship between companions and the player character that start to sort of chip away at that a little bit. So the example image I have up here is um, Kate, and there's this one situation where if you have um, Piper as your companion, no, wait, if you have Kate as your companion, sorry, um, and you decide to change to Piper, who is up the top there, there will be this line of dialogue where Kate says, you two have fun together, Piper, too bad we can't make it a threesome. So you have to have this really specific situation where you have one person, you're already your companion, you're switching to this other person, and you'll get one line that indicates that maybe Kate's actually bi. And people could probably justify that too, like, she doesn't mean like in a sexual way, she just means like that we could all just hang out together, like a threesome, <laughs> right? Like, uh, so like, there, there's like still this kind of little way around it and there's no real explicit kind of conversation about anything like that. So it's like a bit iffy. Um, there's also some bits and pieces in this game world that are queer, which is really cool. There's a whole bunch of different conversations and little quest lines. Most of them are still dodgeable if you kind of weren't interested in pursuing those quests. So they're still kind of all optional. Um, and there's also some interesting stuff where um, some companions have romantic histories, but those romantic histories are typically heterosexual as well. So it's unusual for romanceable characters in a player sexual system to have romantic history at all, but when it is there, it's often oh yeah, I have an ex-wife and a child. Um, it's not kind of, oh yeah, my ex-partner who is in some way queer. Uh, 
Um, so the next example I have up here is a Fable series, and it does some interesting things. Um, so looking at Fable 1 and Fable 2, so we have kind of one player character option in Fable 1, which limits kind of what they can make you do and, and what the uh, kind of system, how the system works. That player character is able to marry many men and women, which is apparently a coding error. So you can kind of do a thing, which is great, but apparently it was an accident. Um, the player character then becomes labelled based on their marriage. So any sort of interactions that are romantic that they have don't label the player character, it's just their marriage. They can be, they start out as unknown. Based on their first marriage, they are either labelled heterosexual or gay. Um, and then if they marry again, uh, and it's somebody of the other gender um, in a, another binary system, um, that labels them bisexual. And that's apparently how that works. Apparently I'm only bisexual if I marry both a man and a woman and it's a coding error. <laughs> um, so yeah, there's, there's this kind of thing where you get a sexuality label, NPCs don't, so NPCs will still kind of be romanceable no matter what, which is still kind of very player sexual. Apparently all of that appears at once, that's good. Um, <laughs> And all of the NPCs who, who are romanceable um, can be romanced. In Fable 2, we have some slight differences, right? So you can actually play as male or female, which means that they've had to make some adjustments to how things work in the back end. NPCs have distinct sexualities in Fable 2, and you can actually look up their profile and see what that looks like. And I have an image on the next slide to show you what that looks like. Um, all romanceable NPCs can be romanced by an appropriately gendered player character. So if you have an NPC who lists that they're bisexual, you can be a man or a woman and romance them. But if you have a, play, a, a um, NPC who is heterosexual, you have to be the other binary gender in order to romance them in-game. Um, Non-romanceable NPCs, such as children, guards and enemies, don't have sexualities listed, however. So although these NPCs have some sort of explicit way of indicating that they aren't uh, just player sexual, um, and you do actually have to be particular genders to romance particular people, kind of like life, it does still make it very player focused because unless you can potentially romance that character as some player character, you don't get to find out if they have a sexuality. There's this idea that like, guards don't have a sexuality because you can't date them. And it's like, they probably do. <laughs> like they probably, you know, are people. Um, but yeah, there's, there's absolutely no kind of indication of that. So that still puts the spotlight squarely on the player and people only have sexualities or interest in sex if the player kind of is an option for them. Um, and also it perpetuates this terrible, terrible thing where, um, all sex workers are marked as bisexual because obviously all sex workers are bisexual and all bisexuals are like interested in sleeping with anyone and that's kind of this weird like they probably could have not done that. <laughs> um, so there's some issues there right even though they're kind of starting to look at this idea of okay can we give NPCs an identity separate to the player they still very much kind of let the NPCs revolve around the player like the sun. Um, so these are these examples. So um, in original fable, yeah, if you've married um, people of like two spouses, man and a woman, sexuality is listed as bisexual. Um, and then fable two, you've got this kind of summary about the person, tells you a little bit about them, um, and yeah, tells you kind of middle class, straight, friendly, bubbly, romantic. Um, you could just put that on like OK Cupid or. <laughs> <laughs> All right, which brings us to the Dragon Age series. So Dragon Age has gone through a bit of a process as well, a different process to Fable, but has kind of gone through some, some phases. Um, so Dragon Age Origins had kind of distinct sexualities, but not very many options. They were basically, you could be like hetero, um, like the characters could be hetero, or they could be um, bisexual or plurisexual. Um, so you didn't really have anybody who was distinctly queer, um, and the people who were bisexual or plurisexual pretty much only indicated that by being interested in you no matter what. So there wasn't like this kind of, it was explicit in that you didn't have every option available to you as the player, but it was only if you were trying to be a bit gay that that kind of came up. Dragon Age 2 kind of 
tried to rectify that by um, making everything a lot more player sexual. So you could queer it up if you wanted to and no one would say no. Um, the DLC is the exclusion there where it did introduce some heterosexuality um, again. There's a character in the DLC that's just heterosexual. But in the actual core game, like there's a lot more kind of freedom. Then Dragon Age Inquisition changes things again by making things distinct and making a lot of different options. So that's a reason why Dragon Age Inquisition comes up a lot in these conversations and a lot of people who are interested in queerness in games have played this and are kind of in some way interested in it. Even if they didn't love everything it did, it becomes kind of a touchstone. So Dragon Age Inquisition had um, heterosexual, gay, lesbian, bisexual, um, explicit kind of uh, characters. It also had pansexual characters. It had a character that seemed like they were trying to be explicitly asexual, but then DLC kind of destroyed that, which I'm un kind of unhappy about still. Uh, <laughs> um, and it had explicitly trans characters. So it, it really kind of tried to make these relationships and these identities and all of these different kind of queer aspects really clear and explicit. Um, there were also things like additional preferences. Most of them were racial, but also actions that you took in game changed whether people would be interested in you or not. Um, so people had like actual preferences as to who they were dating. It wasn't just, you're the player, you're a hero, I want to have sex with you. Like, it's not how, it's not how the real world works. Um, so a few different kind of examples, like you've got Josephine, who is explicitly bisexual in game, and then you have like I'm Bull, who is explicitly pan also known as Pantastic. It's a great artwork that I just like putting on slides. Um, yeah, so there's, there's kind of a lot more kind of examples in this of how you can create a character who is explicitly a particular identity. And the different characters in this are kind of different levels of explicit about it as well. So you might go on a full quest line with one and they might kind of tell you all about their history and how their family is mad at them because of their preferences and all of this sort of stuff. Um, other people, it might be a line, but it's still kind of in there and it's explicit. And it kind of comes out as you create these bonds with characters as well, which is kind of reflective of how that would come out in real life, um, unless one of them was doing a conference presentation and started it by telling everybody that they're bi. So this brings me to kind of, like we've looked at some examples, we've looked at some stats, most of it is just kind of, here is this concept, this is what I'm talking about. But from this you can kind of see, like, there is something about player sexuality that feels lazy. It feels like the easiest, least resistance way to incorporate queerness in a game, it feels like the way that's going to piss off the least number of people, and it leans on bisexuality to do that, but it's not true bisexuality, which makes it way harder to actually find bisexuality in games, or plurisexuality, so pansexuality and so on. Sorry, I keep leaning on bi because like, I'm sitting here like, I just want a bisexual character, please. This is how I identify. Um, so some steps that we could take as developers, um, and I'm coming at it from this angle because I teach game development and I make games, um, is establishing unique sexual and romantic preferences for each NPC. So not even necessarily just the romanceable ones, it's a good idea to have an idea of what these different characters are. So it would be great if there were characters who identify in a certain way but aren't even romanceable. So even if you are the correct gender for them to be interested in you, they're not because they're off doing something else or they have a partner already or they're not interested in that or you for whatever reason. Um, it doesn't always have to be about romance with the player as to why it's defined in the first place. Um, it also is important to remember that this includes a lack of sexual or romantic attraction because our ace and arrow friends always get ignored. Um, attraction to a gender doesn't necessita necessitate, uh, necessitate rather, um, attraction to all people of that gender. So it's important to remember that if someone is gay, they don't like every single man that's ever walked the earth. Or if someone's a lesbian, same deal. Like, there are, there are other things involved in that. Uh, we need to give NPCs unique sexual or romantic histories so that there's more to it than just, hello, I have been kind of created for you. I have entered the earth right now and I am, I am ready to just start a relationship with you if you would like me to. Um, everyone has a history. Everyone comes there from somewhere. It's important to explore that. It's important to make some of those histories queer because we lean on the idea of ex-wives and husbands and children and things that kind of we might see all the time, particularly if we're living in a really heteronormative space. Um, 
but it's important to make sure that we're also letting those queer influences kind of influence the histories of our characters. And establishing queerness within the game world. So don't make it so that the only person who can create queerness is the player. Uh, it's really common in discussions of diversity that we lean heavily on the player as the one responsible for putting it in the game. So that might be in terms of character creation. You might expect the player to be the one doing the labor in terms of creating a diverse character. Same with relationships. Make sure they aren't the only person creating queer relationships in a game. Um, yeah, make sure that there's some sort of relationship happening outside of the player character and whoever they romance as well. So that's, that's my tips for devs. Um, and then there are tips for players on this next slide. Support games that are representing queerness in interesting ways. Even if it's not necessarily exactly what like, you're waiting for, if you've got people in your life who are saying, this thing is interesting and does something well, get your voice behind that too. So if you aren't the expert on that particular type of representation, that's fine, find someone who is, say, is this good? And if they're like, these are the reasons I do or don't like that, then get behind and support and talk about it, right? Lend your voice to the cause. Don't leave it just to minorities to always do that. And that's not just for queerness. Easiest way you can support those games is with your money. If you don't have the ability to do that, or in addition to that, make sure you're contacting developers and letting them know what they did well. People love to whinge about things on the internet, and developers often aren't getting the support that they need financially or kind of with morale <laughs> to kind of continue doing what they're doing. Particularly when you are focusing on making these representations that can be quite controversial, you are definitely going to be getting more resistance than you are support because people are more likely to um, respond in a negative way on the internet. Uh, so get behind people and respond in a positive way. Contact publishers and thank them for supporting diverse games as well. Um, so often people will focus on developers and thank the people who made the game for that. Publishers have a lot of sway in kind of what gets out and they wanna see that people are uh, supporting the work that they are kind of producing and working on and whatever. Um, and that's going to put more money behind more diverse games if they think that those games are actually being well received and have kind of a market and so on. Publicly discuss the representations. Um, talk about them positively, negatively, critique stuff. Um, even if you don't necessarily think people are engaging in that discourse, people are listening. Um, so things like, say, Life is Strange, which is one of the only examples at hand for bisexual representation, plurisexual representation, uh, is not perfect in a lot of ways. It has a lot of great things and a lot of not so great things, but they also don't really have an example that they could have based that on because there's not a lot trying to do what they did. So talking about that publicly and talking about the reasons it's good and the reasons it's not is how we develop and evolve and, and the next title trying to do that will do it in a better way. So positively discuss the interesting and nuanced representations of constructive criticism of representations that might miss the mark. Um, I think, yeah, and then keep up the dialogue. So your developers and publishers are listening. Uh, they definitely are engaging with online discourse. They're definitely paying attention to what people say about their stuff. Um, so yeah, keep up dialogue, and that, that is my tip for players. So people who are waiting until it was over to take photos, that is, that is it. <laughs> I keep watching people put up phones and be like, oh, there's another one. <laughs> cool. Um, so that is the end of my presentation. Um, so thank you.